bringing an institutional perspective in dollar deal world. My guest today, Charles Clinton, co-founder and CEO of CFRE Marketplace Equity Multiple, looks to offer solid returns to investors while protecting their downside. Welcome to the National Real Estate Forum podcast, episode 224. Thank you for joining me today. I am Dr. Adam Gower and this is the nationalrealestateforum.org where I speak to leaders of the crowdfund real estate industry so that you can learn how to raise capital, build wealth and earn passive income from crowdfund real estate deals. In any deal, there is a stack of money that is used by a sponsor to finance the business plan. In its simplest bank and equity provided by investors and or the sponsor slash developer. This is called the capital stack, where the bank's loan sits at the bottom of the stack and is paid an interest rate, and the investor's equity sits on top of that and is paid interest in the form of what is called preferred return, plus gets a share of the profits too. Sometimes there are different types of equity that receive different interest rates and different relative shares of the profits. The way this is usually described is that those closest to the bottom of the stack get, quote, paid out first, unquote. This language pattern implies that everyone is paid out, but some are paid out before others. What it actually describes is an Orwellian balance of power between the various types of investor. When the market goes down, some investors will have the power to foreclose on others to protect their own interests, causing the others to lose everything. Knowing where you are in the capital stack and what that position means exactly is, therefore, a key consideration when making an investment. I exactly is, therefore, a key consideration when making an investment. I've produced an online course that explains this and everything you need to know about crowdfund real estate investing in more detail, including, incidentally, what an equity multiple is and why it's also important. You can find out more about it by going to the nationalrealestateforum.org website, nreforum.org, and hitting the CFRE Investor link top right. My guest today is Charles Clinton, co-founder and CEO of the online CFRE Marketplace Equity Multiple. Charles comes from the sophisticated institutional world of real estate. He has an awareness of the upside that everyone wants from real estate investing that is combined with the desire to protect the downside. The structure he offers, therefore, to investors reflects this balance risk reward approach to CFRE investing. I've included links to Charles' site in the show notes to today's episode at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org. Forward. I started my real estate career as an attorney working at a firm called Simpson Thatcher in midtown Manhattan, uh, mostly for big private equity clients, Blackstone, KKR. Carlisle, kind of all the all the real estate giants. And I worked there for a few years on these huge, huge transactions, you know, multi-billion dollar transactions. And, you know, the interesting thing was my actual exposure to real estate investing was pretty difficult and opaque. You know, during the day and oftentimes late into the night, I'd work on these big real estate deals. But when it came to investing my own money, it was always a difficult thing to do, you know, finding a friend who was doing a small deal or, you know, looking at buying a part of a brownstone with some friends out in Brooklyn. And that just seemed like such a weird mismatch to me. So when the Jobs Act started in 2012 or was passed in 2012, you know, I was immediately interested in 2012 or was passed in 2012, you know, I was immediately interested, um, immediately started kind of reading through it. And especially as the first companies like Fundrise uh, got into the space, was interested to see where, where it could go. It seemed like this was the path really for, for kind of solving that mismatch. So, you know, fast forward uh, after a few months of kind of studying up and, and trying to figure out what, you know, my path of entry into that space might be, I, I enlisted a, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Mario Schulson, who was uh, in real estate private equity um, on the buy side. He'd, you know, been doing it for almost a decade also kind of similarly thought that, you know, this really was going to be the future. And, you know, we set out trying to start a company. Right. So, of course, you know, having had some uh, large private equity experience myself, it does beg the question, why did you leave the comfort and security of a law firm and major clients like Black of Faith in a new industry and a new startup and go out on your own? 
Well, you know, despite uh, me taking the safe route and uh, going to law school and becoming a lawyer, I think I've always had a little uh, entrepreneurial spirit in my heart. And that's definitely part of it. You know, just kind of a willingness to to bet on myself and, and see what happens. But I also, you know, had a real conviction that this was going to be a major, you know, disruptive industry that would change the way that, that individuals invest in real estate. Um, if you look at kind of the big picture of the real estate industry, you know, you have professional investors and endowment funds, you know, investing 10 to 20 percent of their total assets into real estate. And then you look at your average individual high net worth investor, you know, much less your non high net worth investor, and they're averaging under 3 percent of their net worth into real estate outside of their home. So their, their net worth into real estate outside of their home. So there, there, there's just such a big systemic imbalance here. And, you know, I thought if I can be just a part of, of correcting that imbalance, there's really a tremendous opportunity there. So you, me- you mentioned the idea that this was transformative. And actually somebody, I was actually inter- interviewed myself yesterday, which was definitely a novel experience and quite enjoyable. <laughs> but I was asked to um, kind of qualify the idea that I have, which is in agreement with yours that crowdfunding real estate is transformative. Can you articulate a little bit a little bit more detail why you think it is that way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I I think that how this all came about is kind of complicated, but you know, the end result and and why this will change things is really pretty simple, right? It's at at the end of the day, especially for investors, it's about access. Access to direct real estate investments, just that kind of thing. And if you look at the way that people have invested in real estate, you know, it's been through REITs primarily. You have the publicly traded REITs, which, you know, have their kind of own risks of market volatility. And then you have the non-traded REITs, which, you know, really have been decried by investors in the know and the SEC for you know, almost as long as they've been in existence because they're just opaque and they have really high fees. And, you know, I think that a lot of what real estate crowdfunding will be is the replacement for for the that world of non-traded REITs. You know, it can offer access into clear, transparent investments in real estate. You know, it can normalize having real estate be part of everyone's investment portfolio, just like it is for professional investors. Explain the difference then between having an opaque and a transparent investment. Plan. Sure. What, what exactly are you talking about? Opaque and a transparent investment plan. sure what, what exactly are you talking about for the uninitiated so what do you mean by that? i think it's a it's a combination of a lot of factors you know i think it starts with the information that's presented about you know the deal that you're going into right so you know for one of our deals for example you can sign on to our platform and you're going to see you know a long web page filled with you know an overview of the deal pictures of it description of the business plan the financials, information about comparable properties, about the markets, about the condition of the property, really information to let you as the investor know exactly what you're putting your money into and make an informed decision. And you contrast that with, you know, a kind of typical non-traded read, which the sales process has largely been, you know, people sitting in a warehouse, cold calling, and trying to sell a a product over the phone where you don't know exactly what you're investing in. You're just investing in, you know, REIT number 472. Maybe it has a particular strategy, but you have no idea what the properties are. Information about the fees, which tend to always be extremely high, you know, as high as 10 to 15% annually, you know, is buried in tiny fine print. And, you know, really it's, 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 it's about pushing a product on people and trying to, you know, kind of trick your way in versus presenting something, laying out all the facts and letting people make their own decision. So typically when you invest in one of these uh, non-traded REITs, you don't know what the assets are that are in the portfolio. Is that right? Yeah. It's, you know, sometimes you'll know some of the prior investments, but you don't know any of the ones that the future dollars, including your investment, are going to be spent on. And sometimes it's even difficult to get good data on the existing portfolio. And that's just, you know, really the exact opposite of, of what we're trying to do. And I think what, 
you know, most of the good crowdfunding businesses are trying to do. All right. So let's talk about equity multiple a little bit and uh, get into that. Let me uh, back up then and ask you, how, how did you start the company? What, what, what was the process for kicking everything off and what were the challenges that you faced initially and how have those challenges evolved since you started the company? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, to start any company, you need money. Um, so like many firms, we kind of went out and, and started pitching our idea, but instead of pitching it to, you know, venture capital, the normal place you'd go to raise money, we thought we'd one, capitalize the business with, with our own money, but also go out and target real estate companies. Because ultimately, what we saw from our prior real estate companies, and because ultimately, what we saw from our prior kind of institutional backgrounds was that the real value and the hard thing to find in real estate is good transactions from good, uh, reputable operators. So we spoke to several real estate firms and ultimately ended up finding uh, a good partner in a firm called Mission Capital. They are a real estate capital markets firm. They have several different business lines. They have offices throughout the country. They've done over $70 billion of, of transactions over the last 15 years. So what they can provide you know, to us at the outset and, and really still today is a good pipeline of deals that we can then diligence and, and look to offer out to investors. So you know, that's something we, we really tried to get out the right foot and, and differentiate ourselves from the start that way. And, you know, after that, the, 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 the challenges, honestly, that you think you're going to have at the beginning are, are not the ones that you end up having and your investors, your customers actually want. That's very interesting. So what was, the, what was your initial capital used for when you started? You, you sat down with your partner and you had an idea and you understood that it revolved around the Jobs Act somehow. So what were, the, what were your initial building blocks? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think... Scoping out, of course, kind of the legal and regulatory framework, figuring out how we can, you know, take something that was really a pretty bespoke thing, right? These interests in ownership of a building and make that something that is scalable and that you can efficiently bring in smaller investors into these bigger projects. We spent a significant amount of time and money and effort building out, you know, the technology platform itself, you know, which we did in-house with our, our CTO. And getting that up and running and, and making something that, you know, at the end of the day is, is easy and intuitive and makes everything more accessible. You know, that's an important, easy and intuitive and makes everything more accessible. You know, that's an important piece too. So, you know, from kind of day one of, all right, we're funded. Let's do this to getting our first deal up and running off the ground, um, was about nine months. Really? Okay, so that sounds pretty quick, actually. And then you're operating under Reg D, presumably, are you? They're all accredited investors that you're looking for. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, um, you know, I think we will think about non-accredited investors in, in the future. But right now, we feel like the way, you know, the product is built and the way the rules are, are written, that this is the right fit right now. For the only News Digest focused exclusively on the crowdfund real estate industry, please subscribe for free using the link on today's show notes page at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash equity multiple. And what is your, in the kinds of deals, both in terms of asset classes and returns and timescales, etc. Give me a kind of a, an overview of what you're looking for on the deal side. Sure, sure. And, you know, it's definitely been something that's evolved, you know, as the, the market continues to develop. And, and like I said, we're also kind of responsive, of course, to what investors are actually looking for. So geographically speaking, we're, we're, we're pretty agnostic. I mean, we work on both the East and West Coast and everywhere in between. We do limit ourselves almost always to, you know, primary or, or secondary markets. We've done the, you know, I think our largest number of transactions has, has been in L.A., you know, largest city. We've done a lot in Texas, you know, big population centers. I um, think that there's more natural stability there through, you know, rockier economic times. In terms of asset class, you know, we're strictly commercial real estate, no residential. Our asset class, you know, we're strictly commercial real estate, no residential. Our biggest, you know, investment by volume is, is in multifamily. 
So we've also done office, industrial, mixed use, um, and then a couple more esoteric things like mobile home parks, which I, I think are a fantastic kind of little sub niche investment. You know, what we've found is that we're, we're placing more and more of a premium on shorter duration investments and investments that have, you know, a bigger percentage of their total return being paid out, you know, along the way in the form of dividend distributions rather than having most of it be kind of back ended. And that's a little bit of a change, I think, from, from, you know, my, certainly my partner's background where, you know, he would really look at these vet longer term value add. Let's hold this for, for five years and it's okay if there's no cash flow up front. And I think some of that is market is, um, we don't want to bank on kind of that asset level appreciation as much. And we really want to make sure that the, that the business plan is something that can work right now. It doesn't re- rely on, you know, 5% year over year growth or anything like that. Our, our returns, you know, on equity investments and preferred equity investments, we are trying to hit somewhere between a 13 and a 20% total annualized return and, you know, with with, uh, somewhere in the high single digits to low double digits being paid out, you know, kind of currently along the way. So uh, are most of the deals that you look at currently cash flowing or are you raising sufficient money to to carry those current pay preferred returns along the way up front? So we are, are essentially transitioning to find things that either we can fund with with an interest reserve up front um, so that we can support that cash flow during the value add component or that have you know cash flow in support that cash flow during the value add component or that have you know cash flow in place right away and then that cash flow can just strengthen over time through the whole period you know we just we found that investors i think rightly place such a a, a strong premium on that that you know that's that's we realized we just had to also and, you know, I, I think the other thing is we're also doing a lot more preferred equity investments. And for, you know, listeners who may not be familiar, it's essentially a hybrid of equity and debt. So you have, you, you get more upside. Um, the returns tend to be higher than for debt investments, but you also have some good sort of debt-like uh, protection. So, you know, you're going to get paid before other investors or the sponsor operator um, in the project gets paid. And, you know, we found that one, those are good because they do produce that, that current cash flow, even if it does need to be, you know, pre-funded. You know, they also, I think at, at a time when we know that there will be market volatility at some point, they offer some, some good protection. Okay. So that's really interesting. And you also have an equity component as well, do you, that is what strictly uh, back end performance based is that right so they have they, they stand a chance exactly. of earning more but don't have any current pay is that right more more the exactly. traditional exactly ha huh. that's so, really interesting so i can give you you know i can give you an example um mm. of a deal we just did right right outside of uh, old miss and you know it's a seven percent current pay to investors uh, starting you know um, the first quarter after the investment closes and then you, they have investors have payment priority ahead of all the other investors in the deal. So this is just for equity multiple investors. And then once the deal is refinanced or sold, they'll of course get their principal back, but they'll also get another seven percent uh, return annualized on top. A fourteen percent annualized return. It's it's you know maybe if the deal does fantastically, the equity holders will make more. But it it the goal really is to you know, uh, really increase the chance of getting to that nice, strong, you know, low teens or mid teens returns. Well, so what's about the equity investors? How's their deal structured? So, you know, essentially they're getting, they're, they're behind us in line for, for the cash flow and they're behind us in line for repayment. So if the deal does really well, then they have more upside, you know? So if a deal, if the, the deal itself produces a 20% return, then they're they're going to do really well. They'll probably you know get a twenty something return. But if the deal produces a ten percent return, then you know our investors will still make a fourteen percent return, and the equity investors will you know make very very little, if anything. So the uh, equity oh, you've used a couple of terms actually equity multiple higher risk of non recovery of print if anything. So the uh, equity oh, you've used a couple of terms actually equity multiple and uh, preferred equity investors. I presume you mean to use them synonymously, 
those guys, uh, they are capped, are they? They're capped at the seven pref plus the seven if the deal goes well, whereas the equity investors uh, who sit on top of that in the capital stack, they have more upside but also a higher risk of non-recovery of principal. Is that right? Is that how you've structured it? Structured it? Exactly. Exactly. That very, very well put. And you know, we've we, we just found that we like we like that for where the market is right now. And do you give that option to anyone that logs on and is accredited? They, you, you give them. You kind of lay out those two options and see which way they go. No, so here we we only offer the one for for any given investment. We're only going to offer the one option because you know I think that we're talking out of both sides of our mouth and you know putting forth two different options in the same in the same deal. So you know here we we, we really think that this option represents kind of the the best value for investors, and investors can decide for themselves whether they you know want to invest um, in that or not. Uh, so who takes the equity piece? Is that the sponsor, primarily? So here, here it's it's the sponsor, and then other investors that the sponsor is you know bringing on themselves. Oh, I see. It's a very interesting structure. How did you come up with that? <laughs> you know, really, it's it's it it comes more out of the institutional world, and this is uh, it's 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 very common there to see these kind of different tranches of investors. And, you know, we thought that that this is a, you know, not just a good fit for the institutional side, but it's also a good fit for, you know, individual investors, because I think it checks a lot of no investors are, are looking for in that you're still getting a nice return. You're still getting a good portion of that return on a current basis, but you also have some real protection, you know, in the event that the that the investment doesn't perform, you know, as well as the sponsor is, is projecting. So is this something, look, I appreciate that this is a highly evolutionary process. I mean, everyone's kind of figuring out how the industry is is growing and and what what directions is it taking. It's actually in part what makes it so incredibly exciting to be a part of. Uh, Has this structure been largely driven by your investors and what their requirements of or is this something that you've kind of decided on internally and then presented to your investor base it's it's right in the middle you know i think that we've certainly seen in with some of our competitors the success of uh of kind of the high yield saw the investor demand for shorter term current income relative safety and we've certainly heard that from our investors also but it's also driven by you know a real estate thesis which is that projecting out, you know, right right now projecting out five years is difficult. It's always difficult. But, you know, I think we we feel like, all right, some of these projections we're seeing on deals that people are sending us look too optimistic. So why don't we let no. you know the pers- really? we, we let <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Surprise, <laughs> you surprise, surprise, now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we'll let we'll let we'll let the optimist who brings us the deal. They can be the one who takes takes the risk of that. And for, you know, investors coming into our platform, they now have the option of of investing into that same deal, but in a safer piece of it. Fascinating. And okay, so you have just described what I think is a you have just described what I think is a pretty sophisticated structure, right? Uh, for a real estate investment. How are you finding the people that you are attracting to your platform are understanding the structure that you're presenting? How are you developing the awareness in the investing community of what it is that that you're doing? It's a great question. And, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on two things. You know, one is investor education. Um, We have a lot of resources available kind of explaining, you know, everything from the basics to the most complex subjects. And the other is customer service and investor relations. You know, I think one thing that we do extremely well and that I'm very proud of is we're very responsive to questions, whether it's by phone or email. We talk to a lot of investors in a very old school sort of way. And, you know, we do have a huge sort of way. And, you know, we do have a huge range of people, you know, from a doctor who's never invested in real estate before to, you know, someone who's in the real estate industry sitting in the middle of an office in 
you know, Manhattan or LA or Houston or something. And, you know, we, we really do try to cater to that range, both in how we explain things and the level of detail that we provide. And I do think that in some ways, you know, while the, the background structure might be a little more complicated on um, an investment that's done as, as preferred equity, there is something that's also very understandable about, you know, fixed rate returns and, hey, you know, I get paid after these guys, the lenders, but before these guys, you know, the equity investors. And, you know, I think we're, we're dealing with smart people, you know, whether they have experience or not, our investors are smart people. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something I, I think we've been able to do. have then currently. Well, I mean, I think that it's always been finding new investors, getting the word out. Um, you know, part of the reason why we, we love doing podcasts like this is, you know, reaching new audiences, because I think there's still a huge swath of the, the world of the country that doesn't know that this exists. So I think that that's definitely has always been our biggest challenge. I think that, you know, we're definitely starting to see some real snowballing momentum um, on that side of the business, which is which is great. And um, I think that as we look out to the future, I I see a situation where our challenge becomes the other side of the business where, you know, sourcing, underwriting, processing, you know, enough good quality deals to meet that demand is, is going to be our problem. But, you know, that's that's a problem we, uh, you know, we feel like we've positioned ourselves well for and, you know, bring it on. Right. I mean, we're we're ready to kind of grow to that. The future holds for not just you, but for the real estate crowdfunding industry. I mean, I, I think we're at the absolute you know, beginning here still. I, I think we're in the very first few innings. You know, I don't think we've really hit the point of kind of mass adoption yet on either side of the business, whether it's real estate companies looking to bring on new investors or investors looking to get into real estate. So, you know, I think that that still is lurking in the future, which is which is great, you know, and I think that that kind of world of non-traded REITs that I mentioned, you know, that's really what I think this industry is going to start displacing in a major way. And, you know, REITs were raising 14 or $15 billion a year from investors not long ago, you know, as, as, as recently as three or four years ago. And, you know, that number is now, I believe, under $2 billion a year. Yeah, disclosure rules, right, really trip that up Ab- for the most part. Absolutely. But I, disclosure rules, right, really trip that up Ab- for the most part. Absolutely. But I, I think that's really opened the door for the real estate crowdfunding industry to come in and and really start filling that void because the demand is there. We know investors are interested in real estate, want to allocate a portion of their money into real estate. So, you know, now that this window, this one alternative, which, you know, honestly has some real flaws um, is drying up. I I think that we're going to see a real spike in demand from investors over the next few years. And I suspect with that, we're going to see, you know, further consolidation in the industry. We'll probably see, you know, some of the bigger players in the real estate or the asset management world looking to come into the space either directly or, you know, maybe possibly through an acquisition of of one of the existing businesses. And I think we've already seen, you know, sort of more specialization, right? I mean, you have Fundrise has now gone into the, the more specialization, right? I mean, you have Fundrise has now gone into the, the the REIT space. They're they're really raising money for their own non traded REITs, albeit in a in a new way. You have platforms like Peer Street that are you know very honed in on single family kind of fix and flip lending and, and and really concentrating on growing that space. So I think you'll kind of continue to see that and continue to see you know the the, the good platforms grow stronger and deeper. And you know um, I'm I'm personally I think you know there's really room for for several different variants of this business model that offer different value props uh, to investors. So, you know, I think as you look out as an investor, it's it's your your options are only going to continue to improve. As a real estate guy, what are the key daily habits that you have that make you and your business successful? So, I don't know if this is this is real estate specific, but, you know, dedication to process you know, I think that everything we do in our business is is very process oriented, you know, beginning with how we look at every deal from, you know, the day we receive it out through, you know, the time that it, it, it closes and even ultimately sells. So, you know, setting up repeatable 
processes, figuring out how to make them more efficient, and, and really tracking your progress that way. You know, that's been the number one thing that's, that's helped me and, and really helped equity multiple grow. What has been the hardest lesson that you have learned in real estate or I suppose in business overall? What's been the hardest lesson? Oh, it's, it's, it's absolutely be careful who you get in bed with. You know, it's, it's, it's the age old thing, but you know, there's always going to be bumps in the road. You'd never know what's going to happen. But um, if you have the right person across the table from you and they're honest and transparent, then you're on enormously better from there. Honest and transparent, then you're on enormously better footing um, than than the other way around. And you know, for us, that's that's become the number one focus in in, in working with any new real estate company. Is you know, what is it going to be like um, working with them? You know, regardless of what the what the situation is like. And if you could give one piece of advice to somebody who's not yet invested in real estate, but is considering investing, what would that advice be? I would say, do your research and don't bite off more than you can chew. You know, real estate is both a very simple thing um, and a very complicated thing. And, you know, I think that uh, if you're if you're looking to get in on the first time, don't don't jump in off the deep end. I think part of the you know reason why companies like like Equity Multiple are are good, especially for new real estate investors, is you know they let you know how they operate and how they perform over time, without putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, you know you can invest a pretty small amount. Someone else will manage it for you. You don't have to you know kind of learn on the fly with your own money what it's like to to actually manage a property in real time. So you know I, I think kind of take things in sequence and, you know, where you can diversify. Since Charles and I recorded today's podcast, Equity Multiple has repositioned its offering slightly, focusing instead on Regulation D 506B investors rather than 506C investors. Both involve accredited investors, but according to Equity Multiple, 506B is easier to administrate and less of an inconvenience for investors. You can find out more at the show notes for today's episode at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash equity multiple, where you can also subscribe to the only weekly news digest focused news digest focused exclusively on the crowdfund real estate industry. That's all at the show notes page for today's episode, nreforum.org forward slash equity multiple. Next week, my guest is Jason Fritton, founder and CEO of Patch of Land, the crowdfund real estate marketplace that provides first position debt investments to investors for fix and flip loans. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast series on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts at the nationalrealestateforum.org website, nreforum.org, and hitting any of the links that I've included about halfway down the homepage. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you also to Charles Clinton, of Equity Multiple for sharing your time with me today. Until next,